Welcome to Coffee and Compliance, where we connect with experts on various compliance and security topics. I'm Rob Picard, Security Lead at Vanta, and today we'll chat with the head of engineering at a stealth startup and my former boss twice over, Karthik Rangarajan, to help simplify hiring for security and compliance. All right, Karthik, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So let's dive right in. Um, you were the first security hire at Robinhood. I was the first internal security hire at Vanta. Let's talk about what prompted those hiring decisions, um, starting with Robinhood. Yeah, I joined Robinhood just before Series C. This was sometime in March 2017 when it wasn't yet a household name. Um, and at that point, the company has was gaining traction. The users' growth was uh, pretty good. There were about 35, 40 engineers, maybe, uh, and it was it was very much uh, we need somebody that is able to think about this problem full time versus our founding engineer or our head of data science or any number of people coming together and handling security problems because they obviously had. 17 other jobs to do as well. So it was very much a, hey, we need a specialist that's able to come on, that's able to think about this holistically, that's able to bring structure and discipline and uh, some kind of coherent roadmap into how we handle security problems. And yeah, that was, that was basically it. It definitely helped to tell the story of compliance. It definitely helped us tell the story of like, we're meeting our regulatory obligations, we're meeting or exceeding our uh, requirements from a regulator standpoint, which or ICC, whoever it might be, but it was very much a, we need an engineer that is able to think about this problem full time and is able to make disciplined decisions about it. Just like we were making disciplined decisions about backend engineering or product or whatever it might be. I'd love to hear the story of Vanta though. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think Vanta, you know, I came on a little bit earlier than that in the process at Vanta because partially I had just shut down my startup and I you know, cold emailed Christina and I was like, Hey, do you guys need a security person? Uh, and it just so happened that they were also thinking about that internally, like, Hey, when's the right time for us to make this hire? Like, let's start, you know, talking to people and figuring this out. Um, but similarly, it was an issue of like, Hey, there's a ton of people who sort of collectively own this, which is a great state for an early stage startup. But at some point you want somebody who is singularly focused on, uh, you know, coordinating that across the whole company, right? Everything from, hey, like enterprise security and do we have the right stuff installed on laptops, antivirus, stuff like that, to, hey, you know, do we have bugs in our production code? Are we, are we you know, doing all the right things to look for that? And can we prove that to, um, in our case, you know, auditors, SOC 2, um, ISO 2701, uh, and customers, right? Um, which, it's interesting to me because I think it gets into this question of like, when should a company make that first hire? And I think Vanta being a security company, it prompts it a little bit earlier because you want more input on the product. You want more input in conversations with customers, things like that. Um, what's your take on like when most companies should be making their first security and compliance hire, right? Yeah. Yeah. The answer for a compliance hire might actually be slightly different from that of security hire. Um, if you, and it really depends on the industry vertical and what you do uh, for your customers. So if you are, let's say a FinTech company, you probably want your compliance higher. And when I say compliance here, I don't mean technical compliance. I mean, let's make sure we're complying to the regulations of whatever the financial industry regulations are. For your vertical, you might need that very, very early. Your technical compliance might come in a little bit later um, and that might actually lead to, oh, right, we have to comply with all of these cybersecurity regulations. We need somebody that's thinking about this full time. But the reality of when you need it is very dependent on the vertical, on the industry you're in, who you're serving, and honestly, what your stakeholders are asking of you. So let's say you are a B2B company that is selling to banks or selling to like major corporations and enterprises they're going to have very high expectations of your security posture. They're going to expect you to have this security person who is thinking about this full time and saying, oh, our CTO thinks about security isn't going to be a great answer for that. <laughs> In fact, from the other side of it, when I was at Robinhood or Adapar, when I did security reviews and somebody said, yeah, our CTO is our security hire or thinking about security all the time. I was like, are you sure? Because that's kind of a conflict of interest. And so it really comes down to who are you... Um, who are you protecting and who are your stakeholders and what do you need the security person to do? 
generally speaking, if the role that you're looking for is somebody to manage your SOC 2, manage your um, security questionnaires, things like that, you might need a compliance hire more than a security hire. But if you're thinking of, oh, I really need an AppSec program, I really need detection and response, I really need somebody that's able to um, help my engineers write code in a more secure way, whatever it might be, then you need a security hire. My internal metric for it when I've been advising companies has been, when your engineers don't always know what code is being committed, that's probably when you need a security person. Because like, if you have a 20 person engineering team, almost like everyone knows what's going in the code base. Everyone knows kind of the, you know, the, the minds and the time bombs that are sitting in there. When it's a 40 person team, yeah, it gets pretty tricky. And you're writing code that you might not know how it's gonna work or introducing bugs that you might not expect. So that's when having somebody that's thinking about this full time is valuable. The only caveat to that is if you're dealing with like treasure troves of personal information and you have like terabytes of it and you only have 10 engineers, you probably still need a security person thinking about it full time. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's really interesting because I feel like there's an analogy here. I was recently talking to somebody about asset inventory, which is like a very specific uh, security and compliance topic that's like, hey, how do you know everything that exists in your entire company's footprint, right? And one of the things that I said was, you know, this really becomes a bigger problem when you reach the point where you're like, I don't know what everyone else is doing. Therefore, somebody may have spun up like a GCP account. I thought we were in AWS or something like that, right? And I feel like that's a, a very similar point where you're like, hey, we might need somebody thinking about this full time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one thing that might help also in understanding whether you need a full-time person or not is looking at, usually companies when they're ready for their for security hire are hiring security consultants or hiring firms and look at that spend. If that spend starts going to like high six figures, yeah, you definitely need a full-time person because they're gonna be way cheaper for you than paying for these consultants that honestly at that point are just gonna be generating work for your team. They're not actually gonna be able to help you solve the problems and your engineers are gonna start getting frustrated and you might be inadvertently creating a hostile security culture. And that is when you need somebody that's full-time thinking about what should the security culture of my company be and how should it work? That's when you need that kind of a person. And, and that sort of work generation is because they're not fully embedded in the company where they can balance these decisions between breaking things and fixing things and all of that, as opposed to just saying like, all right, I'm gonna evaluate and give you a report yeah. that says, go fix these things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and I, I think that ties into like, you know, what do you want your first person to do, right? It's you, again, every company is different. I'm going to assume that at this point, companies are looking to hire their first security person. They may already have a compliance person. They may not need a compliance person. Um, to me, then it, it really comes down to what you want them to do two years from now. Um, if two years from now, you want them to be running a medium to large team if you it depends on your company's growth as well right like if you're projecting 3x 4x growth which honestly was always the case for every company during the pandemic <laughs> uh thankfully now people are being much more sane about it uh but if you're projecting 2x 3x growth then you want your security team to grow in pace with it there's various ratios different people do different things um the ratio at robin for instance was actually much smaller then the ratio would be at other companies for various reasons. Um, but one is to 20 is, you know, one, one security person for 20 engineers is a ratio some people think about. Uh, other like more, some, some of the older companies, uh, more established companies are almost go for a one is to 100. So it really, it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But to me, if you're writing a JD for your first security hire, you should really be thinking about what do I want them to be doing? If I was hiring a product person, if I was hiring uh, a backend engineer, how would I plan this work? And stick to something that you can kind of map to and that way it'll be easier to create an interview file and stuff like that. The other thing you could do is you could talk to, if you're already using security consultants, you know, you could talk to them and be like, hey, help me write this JD, help me figure this out because they were security hires somewhere at some point, right? Yeah. Um, or talk to your investors. Your investors have probably helped hire uh, security engineers across the board. Like for me, when we were 
doing our CISO search of Robinhood, we spoke to our investors. Or when I was looking to like, expand my security team, I spoke to Capital G and I was like, hey, what do I need to do here and who do I need yeah. to hire? So your investors are going to be a great resource, especially in the early stages. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, and that, that kind of gets into like, what person are you looking for for this first security hire, right? And and I think it's it's kind of the corollary to what are you looking for this person to do and sort of what is your scaling plans like you talked about. But at the end of the day, I think there's like a, there's sort of like a certain profile that maybe you're looking for with this first security hire because it's a very like generalist role, right? And a lot yeah. of times the person you're hiring on, like, you know, gets you from zero to one is not the same person who you're hiring to, you know, be the CISO of a public company and is not yeah. the same person that is going to lead some other function, right? So yeah. um, what's, what's your take on that? Yeah, so usually if you're doing a first security hire, you're still on your own zero to one journey. You haven't hit one yet. Uh, you're still, like, you either just found product market fit and you're scaling, or you're still searching for product market fit in a different way. Um, and at that point, you want somebody that is okay with high amounts of ambiguity and putting on 17 different hats, 20 different hats, whatever it takes to get the job done. And, you know, conventional listener might say, oh, I want the top person at a Robinhood or a Stripe or, or, or whatever. And I would actually say you don't want the top person there because what's what might end up happening is they'll come in and they'll be like, this is all the things I did at company X. I am going to replicate it at company Y because company X is so successful. And if I follow the same playbook, it will work. And it might. It's, it's entirely possible it will. But odds are you don't have the resources for that. Odds are you, you don't have the deep pockets that all of these companies have when, and when making these hires. So generally speaking, I, if I would, when I'm advising companies to find their first security hire, I ask them to go look at the, you know, a really talented senior manager on that team or a really talented, even line manager on that team that might be hungry and, or a staff engineer that is hungry, that wants to kind of grow into a CISO role either in their next job or at some point um, or a principal engineer or whatever it might be, but they may not find those opportunities at the company they are in. They're going to work harder and they're going to be more engaged and they'll have a lot more to prove than the people that have already been there, done that, proved it. They're going to, they might come in and again, I'm generalizing a little bit here, but they might come in and be like, well, I've done this. You should listen to me. Whereas somebody that is earlier on in their career would be like, well, I have to prove myself. So I'm going to work just a little bit harder to tell you why I'm doing this and how I'm doing this. And that might actually be more engaging for your engineers. And for you as a founder or a co-founder or, you know, a CTO, that might be something that's easier for you to deal with than somebody that is just bringing conventional wisdom to the table. That makes a lot of sense. I think that, you know, that idea of like, hey, let's find somebody who is, you know, excelling in a role that is ready to grow. That makes that, that resonates with me. And I think there's also sort of this um there's like a couple of ways you can approach hiring your first person, right? You can hire the person who's going to build out the team. Or you can hire the person who's going to help you build out the team around them, right? Including potentially hiring a manager for themselves and that sort of thing, or helping you hire a manager for them. So it, it sort of depends, you know, you can bring somebody in who wants that, like, hey, I want to lead this team. I want to build it out. I have ideas for like structure and all this stuff. And I want to be a manager um, versus somebody who is technically excellent. And, you know, you're not going to need maybe your second hire for a while. And so you can probably be all right without a specific manager on that team. If you have somebody who's really taking ownership of the the technical aspects and any of the other functions of that role, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, you might actually want somebody that is open to that ambiguity of, I might hire a manager for myself, or I might be that manager. Will do. I mean, when you're a startup, you want people that will do the right thing for the company and that will take your company forward more than like I'm like. There's this. At least for me, when I was working at Robinhood or at Apple, like there was this innate belief that if I did the right thing for the company, I would grow along with the company, that I didn't have to go and you know look out for my own sort of growth. I needed to focus on the company's growth. And you want people that are focused on the company's growth, not altruistically, of course they're going to benefit from it, um, but it's putting the company's growth above personal growth with like obviously the trust and leadership and trust and colleagues that they're going to draw alongside. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And it was, it was very similar when I joined Banta. It was like, hey, we, you know, we want you here because we have, you know, these problems to solve and we want an owner of it. But like, who knows what the world looks like in five, 10 years, right? You can't make those promises at an early stage startup. So having somebody comfortable with that ambiguity who's like, yeah, let's do it. Like, that sounds fun. Um, I think that's a big win. So the last thing I'll ask is, you know, there's I, actually there's two more questions I want to ask. One is. How different is this at B2B versus like a consumer facing app, right? And, and you know, th we could go yeah. on forever about this, but I think, you know, yeah. in general, like what are, what are we looking at there? Yeah, I would honestly say it's, um, it's likely easier at B2B companies to find your first security hire than at consumer companies. And a lot of this, this statement is very heavily colored from my time at Robinhood, so I will give that caveat. But my impression of consumer business is, like, is the pace of product development and growth is so much faster than in a B2B company because the feedback cycle is so much faster. When you are a consumer company, you just ship a product, users are going to be like, this is amazing or this is crap, right? Now you just reiterate and, you know, you, you keep, you keep going forward for a security person. That's challenging. Uh, I mean, we both remember our time on Robin Hood and how we had to figure things out while, you know, things were happening. It was, it was challenging and rewarding, but it takes a different kind of person to deal. Like you take somebody that is not just like. I think the, the reason the early security team at Robinhood was successful is because we all said, okay, we're just going to go down, like put our heads down and write code for a while now. Like, yeah. Yes, some of this looks interesting and funny, but let's just put our heads down. Let's work with the engineering team. Let's just build what we need to build in order to get us there versus simply advising or quantificating or whatever it might be, right? And that's a very different kind of hire from um, if you're a B2B company where you actually do want somebody that's advising and that's like playing that um, like kind of control or playing that kind of um, guardrail person. So I think it, it in consumer, like one of our favorite phrases, Robert, when we were at uh, Robinhood was guardrails, not gates, because when you're building a consumer business, you can't really build Gate. I still it's say that often. Slow down, and somebody else is. Gonna... Yeah, I, I think with a B two B company, you know, it's your customers are going to be much less forgiving of something spontaneously breaking or of a breach or whatever it might be, um, and so that's where you might actually want some gates. You might actually want to build that into your culture in a positive way, not a negative way. I will still say guardrails, not gates. Every single company I work at. But it, again, your business might be different. You might actually need gates depending on what you're trying to do. So it really, that's kind of where I see the difference is that my impression is that B2B companies move a wee bit slower than consumer companies. And the, and the head of security or first security engineer might spend a lot more time on customer calls than they will ever on obviously when you're in a consumer company, especially if you're not regulated, you're not going to speak with external people. You're just going to do yeah. your thing. If you're regulated, yeah, it's it gets a little bit trickier. But yeah, that's kind of where I see the main difference is the pace of development and who are you interfacing and engaging. That makes a lot of sense. And I think a big part of that too is uh, like at a consumer company, you are, you have a much larger surface area, usually than an early stage B2B company. Later stage, you end up with uh, so many products and this, that, the other that you're all over the place. But at a consumer company, you very quickly putting out this product and then this product and then this sub product of that product and then three different apps that do that, you know, it, it, it rapidly accelerates and you just have to, you have to take different approaches, I think, to both. Um, cool. So the last thing I'll, I'll ask is, you know, this is uh, coffee and compliance. We've talked a lot about security. Um, could have called this tea and security. Um, a joke, which, by the way, was in the notes for this episode. <laughs> um, so how does how does compliance fit in, especially in a B2B sense? Because I think that's a lot of the question here is like, yes, like fintech, you're, you're going to end up regulated and all that stuff. And that's um, that is a very specific type of compliance that yeah. often diverges from just security. But really like SOC 2 and ISO uh, 27001, they, they really focus on security. And so... I wonder, you know, is this first person you hire going to be the person who is running your SOC 2 usually or or not? Yeah, 
Yeah, you know, it's a fantastic question. Um, when I was at Adapur, I was running the SOC 2 for them, right? And, and like, I remember talking to Christina right after I left um, Adapur when Vante was being sort of ideated and created. And I said, I really don't want to deal with that again as an engineer. I just want a solution that works. Um, so over the years, I think my view on this has changed quite a bit, which is that I think even at Robin and we used to say this a lot, like the way to comply is to do the right thing. Um, if you do the right thing from a security standpoint, from a privacy standpoint, you're almost always automatically going to comply. Now, both of us discovered the slightly hard way that while that might be true, there is also a little bit of uh, not truism there, which is that, yes, you might be doing the right thing, but like regulators and vendor reviewers look for a very specific way to comply to their rules. So yeah. I'll say, listen, look at this amazing tech that we've built. We're complying. They're going to be like, yeah, but how is this format? Like, how does this comply with the CSF? And I think that is where you actually don't want your security engineer thinking about compliance. You want them to help the compliance person meet their objectives. The archetype of your first security engineer is somebody that is a coder that is thinking about technology, that is thinking about infrastructure, that is thinking about culture, that is thinking about, like, is a technologist. And fundamentally, most technologists aren't going to be excited about writing policies and procedures. And to comply, the policies and procedures, unfortunately, in this day and age, matter just a little bit more than what you actually do. It's all about documenting the thing that you do. And let's be honest, engineers are really bad at documenting. <laughs> And so that is fair. Uh, this is where you want a you want a specialist that is very good at that stuff, that is very experienced at it, that you know that isn't going to be challenged by it. But you want somebody supporting them that is going to make all their assertions true constantly. That is going to ensure that not only are you meeting your compliance objectives, you're exceeding them, not because you're you know looking at CSF and saying oh check check check, but because you're just doing the right thing as an engineering team, and that just so happens to align with what NIST CSF writes or what SOC 2 asks you to do. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Awesome. Well, that's a great place to wrap it up. Um, thank you for your time today, Karthik, and thanks, everybody, for listening in. We hope that today's chat helped you simplify uh, security and compliance hiring. You can learn more about security and compliance topics in the resources section of our website, vansa.com. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content like this. And for customers that feel so inclined, we'd greatly appreciate any feedback you have for us on G2. We'll see you next time.